chapel. So they just started the sermon. Um, we just got here. Monkey Spunk is being a real trooper here. He gives it like a broken toe. I'm cramping up. Not weird. And the reason I'm saying that is because the, the words of comfort or your view of faith or reality and eternity is only as strong as the foundation that it's based on. And so, uh, so right now, I know you didn't just come to hear from me. You came to hear from his friends. You came to hug each other's necks. You came to share your own stories with one another. And be a community of Keely James. So at this time, I'm going to ask Henry to come up. Henry's going to going to share. I told Kim, I says, tell these guys to keep this somewhat church worthy. <laughs> and Henry's, I've, I've heard a few stories about you, so I'm afraid to give you that mic. <laughs> it took a while to find an appropriate story. That <laughs> One second, please, while I pull up my, uh, what I wrote down. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Henry, but I know 90% of the people in here. No introduction is really necessary. One second. Like I said, there are a multitude of stories that I have about Keeley. Some are funny, some are sad, some inappropriate, and some appropriate for church. Most of them dangerous. <laughs> Today I'm going to share one of my more fond memories of him when Keely, Anthony, Austin, and I all worked at a rave called the Rabbit Hole. <laughs> some of you were there. Some of you probably threw us a couple dollars to skip that line. <laughs> Looking around this room, I think most of you were actually there. So let me lay the scene out. The rabbit hole was really the only club in Naples, and it, you know, it come around every couple months. These are really big events in the area. I don't think Anthony and Keely and I ever got a number, but I think somewhere around 1,500 probably showed up, give or take. So Keely and Anthony and I worked front of house security. Anthony brought me in on the job and we brought Keely in. Decent pay, so why not? Our job was to pat people down and take contraband from them. People brought a lot. <laughs> Started these events easily at anywhere from 200 to 800 people in line within the first hour. That's a lot of pat downs, and a lot of patrons were arrogant anti-establishment types who didn't appreciate us taking away what they had come to party with. <clears throat> Keely very quickly figured out that people weren't exactly happy about us being there. And his solution to this, and I'm really not exaggerating here, was to tell every single person he came across his life story and ask every single one of theirs. Mm -hmm. Hey man, how's your day going? Oh yeah, cool, yeah, mine's good. It's another day, right? Yeah, I woke up around 2 p.m., ate a bit, smoked a cigarette, walked my dog, etc. How are you? How's the wife and kids? Every one of those 200 people, 300 people, whatever it was. We had far too many to allow this, so Anthony and I started getting on him about it. Saying stuff to the effect of, in the beginning, Keely, move on, sorry guys, long line, and it quickly became Keely, words I'm not going to say in a church. <laughs> you know what? He never got pissed. He just laughed, and then we laughed with him. The patrons laughed too, but they were on so much dope, they probably were laughing anyway. <laughs> That's just how he was. He made it his personal responsibility to keep people at ease. Not many people care to do that. I know I don't, but he did, and it was part of his character that allowed it. I always admired Keeley. He was one of the smartest people I knew, truly. Upon this, he actually cared. Again, not many people do. When I came back earlier this year from getting a major surgery out of the country, Keeley and I spoke on the phone for about four hours. He cared. We bonded over a mutual understanding of what it's like to be hospitalized and the after effects, which he understood from his back surgery. We bonded over a lot, often having the same mindset but different approaches. He was passive while I'm confrontational. 
He was kind and caring regularly for people actively while I don't. He was open, I'm closed off. Someone recently asked me what I could take away from his life. What lessons and morale I could carry forward. I think that I'll carry forward his ability to be a friend. He listened, he genuinely cared. He was always there and never once asked for any single thing in return. While it's easy to say you do the same, the fact is the majority of us do not or do expect something in return. Keely had an inept ability to be entirely selfless. And I always appreciated that. I'll end on this. There's a lot of people in this room. A lot of love for our friend, son, cousin, grandson, brother, whatever he was to you. It's unfortunate that it takes these circumstances to see this. But I challenge everyone here to look at your friends, those here and not, and remind them that you care. That you too can be like Healy and be entirely selfless for them, like he undoubtedly was for you at some point. Thank you. Good job, Henry. I'm pretty impressed. <laughs> So next, uh, Natty. when I was 14 years old, and he was 16. And I was drawn to him immediately, like most of us, right? My initial reaction was admiration. He was a cluster of darkness that shined so bright, and I thought to myself, who is this creature? This loud, impulsive, crazy, blue-eyed boy. And why do I feel so comfortable around him? Why am I suddenly inclined to let out my skeletons I've been hoarding in my closet? And why am I laughing hysterically while doing so? That's what kind of person that he was. You couldn't be shy around Kiwi, because he wouldn't let you. Everything that was uncomfortable was suddenly comforting when you were around him. And not many people have that impact on someone. And the truth is, not everyone has that ability. The ability to make one feel safe and secure and vulnerable, really. Under really any circumstance, and I'm sure I speak for most of us, that I'm grateful to have that experience with him. He truly was one of a kind. You could be having the worst day, and hit up that motherfucker and chill with him for barely a couple hours and you'd be back to laughing and enjoying yourself and your existence again. And that really is a rarity. He, he was a rarity and you can't replace that. And one of the best things that he did was embrace sadism and masochism. How many of us have scars? I have a lot of them from Kiwi. <laughs> I hope that you embrace those scars because not everyone allows you to, like he did. Allow you to really feel, like really feel. 
and I'll stop myself before I go on that tangent. And I'll end on this note, and I'll quote myself a little bit from my Facebook status that I posted about him. Keeley was one of the most authentic people, and there was not a fake bone in his body. He had a heart of gold that I will never forget. I will hang on to our memories like I'm hanging on for dear life. And I hope that all of you do the same because there will never be another person like him. And our family has suffered a tremendous loss, but it's up to us to keep him alive. And in the quiet rooms, we will be loud. And at the boring concerts, we'll start a fucking mosh pit. <laughs> And when we're drinking, we'll drink an extra one for him. Because he'd call you a pussy if he did. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Keely. Linger on. Thank you. feel instantly comfortable no matter where they come from or what they've been through. I know, uh, you know, um, that quality is all made in my son's first friend in Naples. And he desperately needed one. Didn't always approve of their decisions, but I never doubted Keeley's love for Taylor, just like you never doubted his love for each of you. Okay. Mike? Mikey? <laughs> as I usually hear you call. and eventually came brothers. When I was about seven, eight years old, our mothers used to hang out, and so me and Kiwi always hung out with each other all the time. It was a pretty, you know, normal childhood. We played video games, we made ramps, we rode bikes, we, you know, stayed over at each other's house. We were best friends. We spent all of our time together. As we got older, it went away from you know, kid stuff, and it turned into music, and girls, and you know, more fun. And I remember jumping on our beds, singing the same song over and over and over again until we remembered every word. It was Points of Authority by Lincoln Park. I don't know if you've heard I remember being with him in my mom's car on our way to Sunsplash in Cape Coral with one pair of headphones, listening to an unedited Limp Bizkit CD, which I wasn't allowed to have. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> for a little bit there, through circumstances, our moms moved in different places. We lost touch for a little bit in middle school, but we reconnected again in high school. And it was like we never skipped a beat with each other. Uh, we instantly started doing the same stuff with each other, Raiders, parties, hooking up with girls, 
you know, getting in trouble eventually, which our mothers weren't always super proud of, but we're always there for us regardless. Me and Kiwi had a really special bond. Uh, we were so close and we were always together that people would always call one of us if they couldn't find the other person. It still happened fairly even recently, so. I love Kiwi more than anything. He was really like a brother to me and, and we started connecting and as the years kept going on, he just continued to be a solid part of my life there forever. No matter what I did, no matter how mean I was, no matter what I was going through, he was always there to me like an endless wing man, cheering me on like a cheerleader. He was the best friend anybody could ask for. When I, uh, when I turned 18, I met my wife, and I didn't know she was going to be my wife at the time, but we were all kind of hanging out with each other. And uh, if it wasn't for Kiwi's uh, charisma and, and attitude and, you know, wanting to look out for me, he went over to my wife and asked her what she thought of me. <laughs> and she did. I might not know her if it wasn't for him. Even when I focused a lot of my attention on my wife and wasn't able to give it to him, he was always still there ready to be there for me. And when the day finally came that I did marry my wife and he was the best man at my wedding, he was the best man anybody could ask for. He did everything that I wanted, anything I asked. It didn't matter how hard the task was, he was there. Without any complaint. You can ask anybody who went to my wedding and a lot of you were there, you see them and he was in control. See, the thing about Kiwi is, is we both accepted each other as brothers. And it's a different kind of brother than the brother you're born with. It's a brother you chose. And I don't know who created this quote or who said it originally, and I'm paraphrasing, but the people that you get to choose as your brother in your family are way more important than the people that are there most of the time. Me and him chose to be with each other. We chose to see each other, we chose to hang out with each other. We chose to laugh with each other and cry with each other. I wish you could see all of you wearing green shirts because that would be some of the best things you see in a long time. But I don't think anybody will ever understand the bond me and Kiwi had for each other. It was a real love. It was something that we connected on. Eventually, one day I'll have kids and I'll have this picture on my wall and my kids will miss their Uncle Kiwi even though they never met him because they're going to know more about him than probably most of my other family. Kiwi more like I said than I love a lot of my family and I would have done anything for her but she would have said more to me I'll try to end on this that Kiwi had a, a an attitude and and a demeanor towards people that made him want to open up or made you want to open up and made you want to be his best friend everybody has said it because it's true and it's one of his most noticeable things about him. You just, like Nanny said, you feel comfortable around him. I want to end with this. I, I love you, Kiwi, and I hope you're awesome. and then also for a letter written by Tamara Gibson. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Sophie. First I'd like to thank Mom for the honor to stand here today. I don't know most of you, but I'm thrilled that we're all together today to celebrate the life of our loved one, Kiwi. I was, asked, I was asked to read aloud a message from Tamara, who owned the animal shelter where Kiwi and his mom volunteered for years. Afterwards, I'd like to say a few things about my experiences with my brother, Philip Blood. From Tamara. When I first met Kim 14 years ago, she brought Keely to visit our sanctuary in Naples, our cat sanctuary in Naples. 
He was immediately intrigued with the rescue organization and wanted to be involved. They would transport animals to and from the clinic, foster and take sick or injured dogs home, and provide care until they were well enough for adoption. And Keeley would spend countless hours assisting with the animal sanctuary, fixing things and building enclosures, and helping to give the cats at the sanctuary more enrichment. He would recruit as many friends as he could to come and help, which is how I have the privilege of becoming friends with Mike Clark, Graham Hayes, Ben McQuarrie, Carolyn Cobone, and Grace Parker. Keely became very close with the senior caretaker on site, Frank. He became the son Frank never had. During Frank's final days, Keely was there by his side through hospice. His nature is so genuine and compassionate. He was the person that everyone wanted to be around. I am grateful that I was able to sit with such a wonderful young man. Keely is still with us in spirit, and I wish I could be there in person to join everyone in celebrating his life, but I couldn't get away from the rescue clinic today. I know that's what Keely would want for me, to be there for the animals. I love you, Keely, and you'll forever be in my heart. Thank you, Tamara. I'd like to start my piece with a poem, if you don't mind. You can shed tears that he is gone, or you can smile because he has lived. You can close your eyes and pray that he will come back, or you can open your eyes and see all that he has left. Your heart can be empty because you can't see him, or you can be full of the love you shared. You can turn your back on tomorrow and love yesterday, or you can be happy for tomorrow because of yesterday. You can remember him and only that he is gone, or you can cherish his memory and let it live on. You can cry and close your mind, be empty and turn your back, or you can do what you want. Smile, open your eyes, love and go on. Keely and I first met in second grade. We would walk home from school together and spent the occasional weekend at each other's house. That eventually became every weekend at each other's place. And during summers, we stayed at each other's homes for days at a time. I like to thank mom and my own mother for putting up with us. I can't imagine it was easy. We watched way too much wrestling. We spent hours on our trampoline. We poured water and soap on them and hip checked each other with church socks on. We were outside all day and night getting chewed by mosquitoes, busting our feet up on the asphalt. At night, we'd make cola forts, watch American gladiators, and beat each, other, beat each other up some more, occasionally breaking things around the house and gluing them together before our folks found out. <laughs> As we grew older, we grew in different directions, but we never grew apart. No matter how long we went without seeing each other, when we got together, it felt like nothing had changed. I had the good fortune of running into him about a month ago at Walmart. He was there to pick up some boots so he could get back to work at the animal shelter. We were so excited to see each other, but I still felt that familiar, calming feeling of seeing my brother. I remember looking into his eyes, being amazed by how electric they were. They pierced you and saw the good in you. We hugged each other so tight and told the other I love you. Keely was an original. He was unapologetically himself. He was a natural at everything. He had one of the most brilliant and complex minds imaginable. If you met him, odds are you wouldn't forget him. He could be a roughneck, but had the most sincere heart I've ever come across. The grief that we're feeling, however overwhelming it may seem, is far outweighed by the joy of our memories with him. Mama, thank you for sharing your son with the world. I'd like to paraphrase NBA coach Bunny Williams. We didn't lose him. When you lose something, you can't find it. We know where he is. Keely will always be with us. We have given love as he will want. I love you. Miss you.
So I just recently found out that roasted garlic mashed potatoes made in the microwave, if they are not heated up to the proper temperature and they are lukewarm, they remind you of a certain ex-girlfriend. So make sure you heat them up to the right temperature or they will taste like a certain ex-girlfriend. No bueno. So, this is my first time doing this, and no joke at all, this is, I don't care about the live thing, but this is a life tip. If you're exceptionally drunk, such as myself, and you don't have a strainer, I don't drink coffee, but I have tons of these coffee pots. Pour your hot pasta into a coffee pot, Look, just drain the water out. Just found this out. Just found this out. Yeah, dog's barking. The water just drains right out. The water just drains right out. Anyway, that's all I had to say, and it was entirely too much to type. So, if I helped you out with a little bit of knowledge, Coffee pots are perfect strainers, coming from a non-coffee drinker. Okay, bye.